All the great value investors say that buying a low cost ETF is the best way to go long term. And all the evidence shows this. However, it is way more fun to pick your own stocks. It is way more fun to guide your own future. It is way more fun to learn to invest for yourself, not pick some boring ETF. Now, do I still believe in that? Absolutely. And it works for a lot of people. But if you have the right knowledge and the right emotional mentality in order to be able to handle the ups and downs in the market, you should try to learn how to invest in individual stocks. It's clear that on YouTube, there are countless financial gurus out there. And I use the term guru very loosely. After we got our channel big, based on doing value investing, we started to track how these other financial gurus grew. And it wasn't based on actual knowledge. For the vast majority, it was based on picking one small investment they made in something like crypto or Tesla or some other random hype stock, and the videos blew up and their channels blew up. There was no fundamental reason why they were good investors, and it's out there like crazy. But people, which is very easy, think that because they have a YouTube channel, they know what they're doing. I always tell people in our community, our community over here, when somebody says something to me and I respond with, I think it's a very, very logical comment. There's always like, oh, Paul, it's so nice to hear that from you. And I laugh because I do think I have the knowledge and the emotional ability to be able to go against the crowd. But just because I, I have a YouTube channel does not make me a great investor. But just because I don't have a YouTube channel doesn't make me a bad investor. You need to be able to pull away from the crowd, pull away from YouTube and listen to people and what they're saying. You know, these financial gurus out there, like the Stock Mo's, the Meet Kevin's, even Graham Stephan, who I think Graham Stephan doesn't get into the nitty gritty details on stocks, which I'm glad about. If you listen to these guys, they're absolute morons. I actually like Graham Stephan, but the Meet Kevin's, the Stock Mo's, Andre Jeeks, all these people, they're just idiots. Why? They don't have any fundamental reasons why they're buying companies. They buy it based on a stock going up and they avoid it because the stock goes down. In this video, we're going to show you how to think for yourself and illustrate the importance of doing your own research and believing in an investment you make no matter what somebody else may or may not say. It is dangerous to follow someone's stock advice blindly. I don't care who the person is, even Warren Buffett. His goals are different than your goals. He's going to buy a company for a lot higher price than you should because he has almost an, almost an infinite amount of money that he needs to deploy at reasonable rates of return. Let's use Apple as an example. He's been buying Apple when it hits 140. I'm not touching Apple until at least, at best, a height of 120. And even that's really hard for me to get to. But I have a lot different situation than Warren Buffett. His job is to deploy tens of billions of capital every year into investments that have staying power and can provide a reasonable rate of return without going away. There are thousands of videos on our channel about value investing, the art of value investing, the process of value investing let alone millions out there on YouTube. Sifting through and finding key videos that speak to you and that have the right process are going to be so important for this journey. It is important, very important, that you never follow anything blindly. That includes following us blindly. On Everything Money, we pride ourselves in teaching you a process that works, that we have tried, that many other of the best investors of all time have tried, and that is what we stick to. But again, I don't want you to take this at face value and say, they just know exactly what they're talking about. Go through things, back test, do research, run screeners on, on different companies, find out what works for you. Seek out other sources, seek out things that differ from us. This is all part of finding your own process that works for you. There is not one way to skin the cat. See where these teachers are coming from. See what their backgrounds are. See how they develop their process, and that's where you can start to develop your own process. Everyone has people they admire in the world of investing. The question you need to ask yourself is, do they have a clear and concise process? Second, is that process, can you look at history and see that process working over long periods of time? Whenever somebody comes to me and says, I'm a great investor, and I say, okay, how long have you been around for? Oh, 25 years. Great. Show me how you've done since 2005. And there's blank stare. Well, Paul, I had one somebody recently tell me I was up 78% from April of 2020 after COVID until the next year. I said, I don't care about one year. 
you know, I get comments all the time in this community of people thanking me. And I say, guys, thank me in 10 years. I'm here to show a process. And my process has not worked in the last five years. But guess what? I'm okay with that. And I see the benefit of why that is. I get it. People want immediate, hey, why is this not working? Well, not everything's going to work all the time. The best baseball hitter of all time, Ted Williams, he still had droughts. He didn't bat 411 at all times. He had droughts where he probably batted 200 for an extended period of time and batted 600 for an extended period of time. The point is, are the people you're following and you respect, do they have a clear defined process and do they have the ability to stick with that process even if the rest of the market is telling them they're wrong? That's the hard part. I remember a few years ago, People I knew saying Warren Buffett's lost his way. He's at, guess what, guys? At every market peak, Warren Buffett is talked about losing his way. It happened in the late 90s, happened in the late 2000s, and it's happening again today. But then you look at his stock over the last few years based on their same, and guess what? I don't believe just because their stock is up over the last few years, it means Warren Buffett's better. I look at his process and say his process is better. Anybody can ride a bull market up. A rising tide will raise all ships. The question is, what is your process over a long period of time? The people you admire, what is their process over a long period of time? Is it sound? Is it fundamental? Does it factor in the things that you don't know that you don't know? The two most important books I suggest people to read, Psychology of Money and The Education of a Value Investor. Psychology of Money was written by Morgan Housel. I tell everybody to read that first. It doesn't talk specifically about investing per se, but it talks about how you should think about money and how you should feel about money. And he talks about how short-term luck can make anybody feel really good or really bad. Remember, in his book, he talks, if something has a 20% chance of not working out, if it doesn't work out, does it mean it was part of the 20% or was your, or was your process flawed? Well, that's why we look at people who have long-term investing experience and say, wait a second, this person has a long-term experience of making the right decisions over long periods of time. That's the hard part for somebody who's new with investing. You don't know, if you started five years ago, are you good or are you just good because you had a bull market? I was the same way. I remember my senior year of high school, I was not up 98.6% that year and I thought I was a genius. And then things came crashing down. Okay, what's the difference? Well, I was in a major bull market back then. It made me think that I was smarter than I actually was, right? Now, recently, I've not been up a ton. I've been up four or 5% a year for the last five, six years. People think that, well, I've also been sitting on cash making 0%, right? And that's the hard part. How much of it has to do with luck, situation, et cetera, but over long periods of time, it works out better. In The Education of a Value Investor by Guy Spear, the reason I love that book so much is he talks about the emotional problems that come with investing. I remember specifically, he said, in 08, all my value investor friends, all of a sudden the market fell 30, 40% and they were bailing. And I said, wait a second, isn't this what we were waiting for? It's always, I always laugh whenever I hear somebody say, well, you know, whenever, if stocks go down half, that's not going to worry me. It's easy to say that when you've never seen stocks go down more than 20% and rebound very quickly thereafter. But when the news is bad, the stocks are going down, earnings are down, can you still stick with it? Because as we always tell people during good times, you have to normalize your income. Same with valuation. We look at the stock market valuation based on 90, 100 years of data almost, going back to 1929. And right now it says stocks are overpriced by 68%. I still have tons of people telling me, well, I get it, but here's why it's not as bad. Okay, sounds good. Now, they could be right, or it could be what I always hear during bull markets. Yeah, but, because whenever there's bad news, it's like, well, yeah, just like if there's good news, I could say, yeah, but. There's always a way to, there's always a yeah, but to every piece of information. But these two books are especially important for you to read before you read anything else about understanding financials. And the reason being is, if you don't have the emotional fortitude to stand your stock going down and being okay with that to buy more, you're not going to make it. Every single time I start a position in a company, you know, I think to myself, hope it goes down. I hope it goes down. You might think I'm making that up. I absolutely have the trades to show it absolutely love it. It goes down because I know eventually if my thesis is correct on enough companies, I will do very, very well. The thing about value investing is it's against the grain. Some people might say if everything is moving in one direction, that has to be the right choice to make. Correct? Well, we say no. And some of the best investors of all time say no, like Tesla, like crypto. If it's so easy to make money on something, 
there has to be a catch. Something can't be right. So when it comes to investing, how do you think for yourself? Number one, be a sponge. Absorb everything. Read a lot. If you look at the biggest investors of all time, some of the best right now, Monish Pabrai, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, what is something that they all have in common? They read and read and read. And they absorb a lot of information. Sift through all the crap. Learn how to invest long term. Buy a company and hold it for a very long period of time. See the long runway that the company has. Don't look and just say, I'm going to invest in this and within six months I plan to be out of this. In three months I plan to be out of this. This is all for the long term. Number two, ask questions. This is one of the most important. If something doesn't look right, if something doesn't feel right, ask why. Go and ask people. Don't just take everything for the gospel. You are allowed to poke holes in things. If something looks off to you, take a Peloton, for example. There's probably something wrong. Just because the stock price is up here doesn't mean that they're making money, doesn't mean that they're generating profit, doesn't mean that they're generating free cash flow. That is often the case. Don't just chase high stock prices. Ask questions of why is the stock price up here? Is it justified being at this valuation? Looking at digital coins, to me, there's nothing behind them. So I ask myself, how does this thing have any type of value if there's nothing tangible behind it that generates a type of value. Number three, ignore the outside world. This can be very difficult. You are going to hear your friends, your family, the media, chomping in your ear, saying a lot of noise. You need to remain focused and focus on your goal. Focus on your process. Don't let the day-to-day -day noise deviate you from the goal that you are here to accomplish. Imagine a world in which the best investor of all time by far gets criticized on a daily and yearly basis when the market's up a ton and he is not. That's what it takes. And guess how much Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger care? Zero. I've been blasted for my picks. In fact, people have made up lies about my picks. So like, oh, you bought this at this price. No, I didn't. The point is when a stock that I believe in goes down, I buy more. When a stock that the other financial gurus buy, goes down, they bail. There's literally... Stock Mo once said, if Workhorse doesn't get the United States Post Office contract, I'm still going to hold it. They didn't get the contract, days later he sold. Come on, that's hypocrisy. Not just picking on him, he's not the only moron out there. But what we had to do is be independent thinker. Be an independent thinker to be able to be okay when a stock that you like, fundamentally sound, goes down in price. It's just Mr. Market. And if Warren Buffett can do it, anybody can do it. The question is, can you train yourself emotionally? I was not this way all the time. I used to be emotional. I remember being in my bed once in 2002 going, when is the market going to stop falling? And I was scared to death thinking the market was going to zero. I literally believed those words. And now I just laugh at that because it's absolutely not true. Okay, so we've talked a lot about research. Now, what exactly does that mean? First, come up with a list of stocks that you would want to buy or come up with a screener that can condense a list down. How do you do that? Use our eight pillar screener, use pillar screener, go through and find some stocks that hit basic metrics, very basic metrics that hit your initial criteria. Now from there, it's going to be a lot of saying no. We are professionals at saying no. When we talk about being able to say no to a company within 10 to 15 seconds, we're being dead serious. This is something that some of the greatest value investors in the world can do. They can look at a bunch of metrics, look at a balance sheet, look at an income statement, and initially go pass on to the next. There are 10,000 plus companies out there. You can afford to say no. You cannot afford to say yes to everything. Now, this doesn't mean that you're never going to be interested in a company. This just means have a stringent sc screening process. Don't waste time on stuff that is never going to be a buy for you. The company may not have any cash flow. It may not have any profit. It may be so young in such a new industry that you cannot say, yes, this is what the future is going to be for this company. Take EV, for example. We look at profit margins on them, and the only thing that we have to compare them to right now is previous car companies. We think that they're going to fall in the same category. Buffett thinks that they're going to fall in the same category as just car companies. But could their margins be bigger? Could their cash flow margins be bigger? Sure. We don't know if that's going to be the case. So for now, to those big EV companies out there, we say no. Once you've figured out the process that works for you and you find an intriguing stock, the first thing I always do is I put it in our stock analyzer tool. And the reason being is I need to figure out one, 
is it reasonably close to some sort of value I want to buy it at? If it's not, I add it to my watch list at the price I want to do. So let's look at an example. Let's go to stock analyzer tool and let's pick up a pre, let's pick up Ferrari here. So I did a 20 year analysis on Ferrari back here and let's go down here. Okay. It's got a wide range of values. Let's focus on the earnings 106 to 233, but my $233 value was assuming some very high assumptions. So I'm going to focus here. That's why I have it on my watch list at 150. Well, guess what? It's currently at 291. Don't do any work. I, I'm not doing any work. And by the way, there are questions I have right here. First question is, why are cash flow and earnings so different? I don't care right now. You know why? It's nowhere near my value. Even on the rosiest assumptions, I can't get there. So why do any more work? Guys, you're talking to one of the laziest people out there. I have great people around me and I'm able to set a vision and motivate, but I want to do as little work as possible. That's why I stick with large companies that aren't going away and I put them in my stock analyzer tool. And the second I get my value, if it's far away, I move on. I put it in my watch list and wait for the trigger. The second my watch list tells me it's 150, what's the first thing I'm going to do? I'm going to figure out this answer within a matter of hours, because if the answer makes sense to me, I'm going to buy that company for whatever price I determine I want to buy it for. Now, if you're interested in smaller companies, you really need to do a deeper dive. Read the 10K, listen to earnings calls, find out what the company is doing. Is the management competent? When I say that, I mean, what are they doing as investors? Remember, a CEO's job is to be a proper capital allocator. Tim Cook recently said he never thought about capital allocation until he met Warren Buffett. And now he's focused on allocating capital the proper way. If your CEO of the company you like doesn't allocate capital properly, it's going to be a bad investment. When I say allocate capital properly, are they paying dividends at the right time? Are they, paying, are they buying back shares at the right time? Are they holding a lot of debt? Are they reinvesting the cash of the business at higher rates of return that'll build more value and compound for the investor? And guess what? Maybe the company is so big like Apple, they can't reinvest. So the most important part is, are they distributing money to the shareholders in an efficient way? Are they buying back expensive or inexpensive shares? These are the things you need to understand as an investor. And the bigger the company, the less you have to do research on them. Apple ain't going away. These big companies aren't going away. But if you find a company with a $200 million market cap, guys, that's a big company, but I ain't big enough. That can go away tomorrow. You need to do a lot more deep dive. You need to do a lot because not less analysts are following it. That's the big key. It's been proven time and time again that in order to be a successful investor, you have to think differently. You have to think for yourself. Do the adequate amount of research necessary for the company you're buying. I can't stress this enough. The smaller the company, the more research you need to do. The bigger the company, just understand what drives the business and are you still on track with that. The most important thing is to think for yourself when you invest, because if you take somebody else's ideas blindly and it doesn't work out, you're not going to be able to keep buying as the stock falls further. You need to do your own understanding. And if you don't get it, there are plenty of stocks out there in order to buy. Thank you very much.